So welcome everyone. Uh, today's session is about growth, uh, product-led growth versus product marketing. How are they different? Uh, what are the similarities between them and which companies use what strategy when they think about growth in general, which is thinking between product-led growth versus product marketing, or maybe they go hand in hand. So we have a very exciting panel in front of us today covering both the consumer side of the world and the, and the business side of the world. Uh, on the business side, we have Charta, Chartio, uh, Dave Fowler, the CEO and co-founder who's joining us today. And we have the VP of product marketing, uh, Xavier from Algolia, uh, joining us on, uh, on our panel today. Hi, Xavier. Hi, Dave. And on the Thanks. consumer side, we have Anya, uh, who is the former product lead on Spotify. And I'm your moderator, Mayank. I'll be uh, curating and, discuss and, and taking the discussion forward. I work on Facebook Marketplace as a product lead. So uh, we'll do a quick intro for, for all of us, uh, just one or two lines each, and then dive into the discussion right away. Uh, I can quickly start with my intro and then go round table. Cool. So uh, I'm Mayank. I'm a product lead at uh, uh, Facebook Marketplace, uh, working on their uh, C2C and B2C products for marketplaces globally. I've uh, been here for about four and a half, for about, about four years. And before that, worked on other companies, uh, which are very marketplace focused, like Uber, eBay, and some startups in New York. Yeah. Zeb, do you want to go next and give a short intro? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, Mayank, for, and really pleased to be joining you all today. Uh, so my name is Xavier Mazabo. Um, I lead uh, product marketing at Algolia, uh, and I've been in B2B tech for about 21 years. Um, some of the notable companies are Salesforce, um, uh, Dropbox, Google Cloud, and now Algolia. Uh, for me, uh, my journey into product marketing came from um, being a consultant and a pre-sales engineer, uh, and then really got passionate about evangelizing and telling the product story. So that's a little bit about my background. Thanks, Xavier, welcome. Uh, Anya, do you wanna go next? Sure, I'm excited to be here. Um, curious to talk about all our different opinions about product versus market like growth. I um, am currently kind of doing an independent thing. I am advising and consulting a lot on product, especially trying to focus on earlier stage startups. I'm actually teaching with the product school as well. So I teach Lovely. the intro product management course. And previously my last full-time role was at Spotify where I was focused on building tools and software um, services for the music industry. And before that I was at Microsoft and I was focused on all things Minecraft. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanya. Welcome. Uh, Dave, you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm Dave. I'm the founder and CEO of Chartio uh, and uh, I'm a very product focused CEO. I've been working in data and SaaS for almost a decade now uh, and just very obsessed, very focused on uh, at Chartio making it so anybody in the company, not just data teams, can explore and understand the data. Uh, solving those problems and and uh, yeah, a lot of experience both trying to go enterprise and SMB, uh, being product led, being product marketing led, uh, and so uh, excited to chat about that with you guys today. Awesome, awesome! Thank you so much. Super excited to be in this group, uh, having a very exciting conversation in front of us. So I think uh, I was uh, wondering how should we start, and then I thought, what's the Uber goal? The Uber goal for all of us is growth. Uh, so I would like to start with how each of you have thought about growth, either in your current role or in the previous role. Just a quick intro on that, uh, which can cover the overall growth strategy for the product that you have seen. And after that, we start deep diving into the two things that we're discussing today, which are product-led growth versus the marketing growth that we talk. So uh, I will kick it off to start with, uh, let's go with Anya first this time. Anya, do you want to talk about how have you approached product growth in the past in any of the companies you work with. Uh, and yeah, just let to hear from you about that. Are you there? I think. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you get fun time and die? Please look at any time. Um, so when I tend to product growth is because um, I think the last role that I was really working um, and focused primarily on growth, both user focused or revenue focused was um, actually during my time in Minecraft. A lot of my time at Spotify was spent on trying to find product market fit for pivoting into these new services. 
So generally what I would say is, um, especially since I was consumer focused when we were talking about video games and users, right? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of that growth was towards the mature stage of my product. Minecraft was already the number one top selling game. So I tended to focus a lot on what particular feature or product we were focusing on and what would be the right way to go in terms of ha having it take on more of a marketing focus versus more of a product-led focus. For example, when we were focused on growing the marketplace, we really wanted to drive a lot of organic interest in um, what we call DLC, the downloadable content, like skins for your character and skins for your world that we were offering to players. And we knew that we had a very naturally involved community that grew organically, thanks to YouTube. <laughs> um, so we focused a lot on meeting the user's needs, on doing focus groups and user interviews, which I would call more product-led growth, focusing a lot on the initial stage of figuring out which products would be the most relevant for them, which ones would get the most organic traction with our users. Whereas when we were pursuing um, partnerships with other brands, for example, we would partner with the likes of Disney on Star Wars and make those kinds of downloadable content. Um, for our users, we would focus a lot more on making sure that we had a solid launch plan, our product marketing would lead and partnering with the other brands um, and really making sure that the awareness is there because there the opportunity was on the tail end to include new users that aren't initially considering or aware of Minecraft perhaps, but are aware of the other brand that we're partnering with. So we focus a lot more on the tail end and making sure we had solid planning in terms of capitalizing on the marketing momentum. Awesome. Thanks, Anya. Anya, uh, just to uh, confirm, uh, you broke off, uh, broke, uh, broke off oh, a little bit. Sorry. So the, not, not much though. Uh, so the product you're talking about is uh, the Microsoft game that we worked on, right? And was it, what was the name? Uh, what is the game again? I missed that. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Five second quick background. Minecraft. So uh, Minecraft, of course. Yeah. Minecraft is a really popular game. It was initially yep. developed by an indie yep. studio yep. in Sweden yes. and Microsoft yes. had acquired yeah. the game studio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we all love Minecraft, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I think two interesting points that you call out here was number one, the stage of the product also matters. So it's not about we can deploy anything we want. It's need to evaluate where what stage the product is in. So it was a mature product that you worked on. That's mm -hmm. number one for all of viewers. The piece is important. And second is um, you split very well between both product-led marketing and a product-led growth and marketing, where it sounded like uh, for your specific product, uh, a lot of awareness was done through marketing. And then you had this organic product which you were understanding through research to figure out how can you grow it once you have people coming into it. Is that a right framing on how you approach your uh, overall growth uh, for Minecraft? Yes, and if I were to char characterize it a little bit like gen more generically, I would say, so it's not only the stage of your product, but it's also whatever you're currently focused on, on launching or building, what stage in the product development life cycle you're at, right? Ideally, you're thinking about this before you even start brainstorming or you start prioritizing what opportunities of what you want to build because it's based on the goals of what you have for it, right? What is your intention for prioritizing to launch and to build this thing? Is it to grow awareness? Is it to grow users? Is it to fulfill user needs and pain points? Because that can inform whether you want to focus more on product-led growth or marketing-led growth. Yeah. I completely agree with this. Like the setting the goal is super important and then that we can figure out what exactly, which direction we should be going and also helps the team to brainstorm in the right direction because I think all are cool ideas. Like focusing on a community for gaming, amazing. Focusing on a marketing plan, we all want to do that. But aligning on the goal is super important. Uh, awesome, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to Minecraft in a bit. Uh, Dave, you had a point, go for it. Yeah, I, I, I was, yeah. was going to call just like to bring some conflict to earlier, which yes. makes it more interesting. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, the, the premise of the first question, you know, you started with, uh, and this is this is great coming from a Facebook person is saying, of, of course, goal, growth is the main goal. So what do you guys do? Uh, that's not always the, the main goal, yeah. especially depends on what yeah. phase you're at. Um, and so for us, like, you know, we're, we're really trying to create this big innovation and we're really trying to enable a piece of technology that like, and, and working that, 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 wasn't hasn't been possible before uh so you know excel's been around for 38 years now anybody can use excel but as soon as data gets bigger than a spreadsheet you got to learn sql 
and or or really complicated BI products. And so we, we want to make it so anybody can do that with the same ease of Excel. And so there's a lot of like fundamental like UX problems in there. There's a lot of technical problems, a lot of obstacles. And we have actually like a 40 page document called the, 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 the problems to solve to to really join people on data. That's what we call our mission, join people on data. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's there's an extensive set of problems and, um, uh, you know, thinking about growth and integrating that and the whole sign up is definitely part of it. And obviously we, we will, we get growth the closer we get to that and the more problems we solve. Uh, but, uh, but it's not always the, the main focus, obviously, of, of, of every product team. That's a very good point. And I think when I said uh, growth as an Uber goal, I meant if your growth is go, if your Uber goal is growth, then we have these two uh, paths we can take, or maybe it's one path with two elements. I think what you just said is a very interesting point, which again aligns with Anya's point, where we have to consider where in the life cycle of the product we are at, and what should we focus on. So it could be the growth is uh, the long term growth would come, maybe the the growth will come in in two years or one year, what milestone we should achieve in the next near term uh, and what is the strategy for that? And it could be product-led growth or it could be uh, product marketing or maybe none and focus just on building and solving for the users. Absolutely fair. But the, the core point, I think I completely agree is on the stage also matters. Define where you are at that stage and pick the right goal that you should focus on, which may or may not be growth in near term versus long-term growth plan. So totally, I completely agree with that. Thank you for bringing that nuance there. Uh, awesome. Um, any thoughts from you, uh, Xavier, on this? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, um, obviously I'm a little bit more in the B2B space. Algolia, we're software as a service, or search as a service, I should say, rather. Mm -hmm. we, we service about 9,000 customers and you know run the gamut from SMB to mid-market enterprise. Um, from our perspective, what does growth feel or look like? Like we're definitely in a, you know, a crowded market in the sense that there's a lot of competitors in certain niche areas of what search is related to, such as e-commerce. So for us, growth is a lot about like mind share with customers, uh, mm -hmm. like customers adopting additional features that will give them more capabilities. In our world, it's talking about conversion and uh, talking about um, uplift in sales and mm -hmm. you know, more activity on search on their site. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we think about. It's kind of both like, you know, revenue growth, but also like going deeper with customers and also unboxing more features whereby they can get more value. And the more adoption mm -hmm. we get for those, those features and, and the value from the customers, the more we're, we're sure we're on the right path or we, we can further our efforts to develop a product, say towards personalization or AI capabilities than maybe other other capabilities. So it kind of helps us. I think growth is like a mutual dialogue with the market um, and where you establish some goals, but you also need to continually uh, have your ear to the ground with customers, with prospects, with your sales teams in mm -hmm. the B2B space, at least to really understand what's resonated and, and, and what isn't, right? That's, that's very good. So I think uh, just to uh, I'll extract some of the learnings from myself on the B2B side as well from this uh, talk of yours, like, I think what you're saying is uh, the type of marketing could be different as well, where you go and, and show the case studies that are outcome-based uh, result, uh, results that have been shown in the previous sort of uh, uh, use cases that you have uh, seen success, which is a different strategy than going all out and do a pretty big marketing campaign. Uh, that's how you sort of bring the people to your product and that has to happen, obviously. But along with that, let's call it uh, a, a mark. Is that product marketing for you? Will that be the right way to look at the bucket? Okay, awesome. And the yeah. second bucket is still there, which is the product-led growth, which may not be instant, or it may not be changing a button to green from to blue to see the impact right away. However, learning from them and going back and influencing the roadmap to come back with a much more long-term impact. So there's a constant cycle that also goes in. Uh, with the B2B, with the businesses to understand the needs. So again, it's, it feels like they go hand in hand, like both for if it's consumer or it's uh, B2B, they, they're always, uh, it's, we both have, we, the, both the uh, scenarios have um, product led and product marketing going hand in hand. I, I agree. And, and I, I just yeah. add, like, I talked a lot about companies and customers. Obviously, developers are a massive part of what we do as well. So mm -hmm. that's probably closer to a more product led type organic adoption, if you will. So that's also mm -hmm. 
super important for us to, to keep in mind and to make sure we're easy to understand what we do, to sign up for a trial, to get up and running. So Perfect. that's probably closer to some of the other freemium or B2C style products out there. Awesome. That's very interesting. Uh, but even for developers, I think I there, there has something. to be... Go ahead, Anya, you say something? Oh, I was going to say, since you did mention changing the color of a button, that is yeah. not to be under, understated when it comes to product growth. Um, a testing of a button or drawing attention to an upsell screen can have huge impact overnight <laughs> just by testing agree. some of those small iterations. Yeah. And that's yeah. totally part of it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think uh, those are the first things we would love to focus on because uh, that's what the biggest wins comes from making it easy for, to increase the visibility of the product uh, with the users. I completely agree. Thank you for calling that out. Um, awesome. Dave, do you want to uh, say anything about Chartio on, on how you guys think about growth in general? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you were just kind of getting into a framework of how to think about uh, product marketing and, and, and product like growth. And I, I think um, product marketing uh, is definitely a big part and important part of product like growth, you know, product marketing, the positioning, the messaging you have to people, how it all fits. Um, but I think you can also, and a lot of companies and most of my competitors have a lot of product marketing, but not product like growth. Um, uh, so, so there, there's also that world, especially in like enterprise uh, sales and enterprise led companies that, that don't have a self sign up flow, uh, you still have a lot of product marketing there, but um, um, so, so product marketing can live independently of product led growth, but it's also a part of, of product led growth. If that, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I totally agree. When I was just thinking about um, the topic of this panel in general, I was almost a bit confused because I don't see why you need to differentiate so much, especially since I've been consulting in startups um, that are a little bit further on they tend to obsess about being able to attribute impact and value back to a certain function or a certain team. But I mean, the best product development or the best product growth is collaborative and it shouldn't matter whether it's technically marketing or product like growth. And in my case, the best practice is for both parties to be involved throughout the product development life cycle. So marketing should be involved and think about product uh, marketing led growth as you're brainstorming and prioritizing what to build and, product should certainly be involved in that conversation as well. And then later on at the end of the product development, like I said, when you're thinking about the product lunch plan um, and content marketing or how you'd want to make sure that your users, customers are aware, you'd also want both parties involved. Not just come in and like more traditional respective parts. Cool. And, and I think uh, I agree with that. And this is, I know you're breaking off a little bit. You're saying something? Yeah. Maybe you could go off with you. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're getting cut off here. Yeah, um, yeah uh, to summarize that, uh, yeah, may, maybe the real, it's it, the alternative to product-led growth is, is kind of sales-led growth. Um, and, and which does heavily rely on product marketing and other people can kind of associate that. But I think um, a huge part of sales like growth is product marketing. Um, but I think product marketing is kind of the one that, that transitions and stays with you even as you move to, uh, as, as, as more and more companies move to um, product like growth, uh, as more and more new companies. And that, that becomes an increasingly popular uh, way, to, way to bring a product to market. Um, but product marketing kind of like persists through uh, and yeah. and works for both. Yeah, I think I'll add one more nuance there. I mean, uh, I completely agree with both of you. Like the products I have worked with, it's never marketing growth or product growth. It's, it's one growth team that works on the problem, which could be either a long-term problem or a short-term problem based on where the product is at that point of time. And we all bring in the team together, marketing folks, engineering, research, design, everyone, and form a core team to to address that, finding, understanding the situation, the opportunity, and then go work on it. I agree. I've seen a flip side of it also, which is primarily on uh, traditional companies who are offline companies coming uh, and now becoming online. So for instance, if you look at uh, 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 Walmart uh, in the past, I've spoken to a couple of people there, or some traditional offline, uh, 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 traditional non-online companies, if you will, 
they already had a marketing department which was running marketing and now comes technology and product oh we have a new thing that we are work, working on and we to bring people into into our website into our app to do the conversion uh they do see a nuance there a little bit uh where the marketing team operates um uh, as a marketing team whereas the product team has their own thing and slowly they're blending in as well these days but that's where we have seen some nuances in the in the in the market today but i i am completely with you on that they are one thing together but could be different uh, roles to play for the same goal which could be bringing more people and convert them awesome anya welcome back sorry about that but you guys saw my lovely penguin mona lisa <laughs> <laughs> we love your plant in the background that's great <laughs> Okay, cool. So uh, let's anchor on an, uh, an interesting point that we all talked about, which is the stage of the product. Dave's product is a little bit early. They are they're disrupting the market. They're coming up with the, building the product. So what they need is different than what uh, Anya needed in her Minecraft story or what a Facebook Uber slash uh, Google would need. And same goes for Algolia, where it's established product with a lot of crowded space. How do you create your navigate your way? So the question is. do you think uh, as we're starting i'll start with dave so basically you are building a product uh, still like it's not a huge product yet you don't have a big market share so you're still growing you're still building the product towards uh, showing it to the users where is where do you think about growth coming from in the near term do you think about a or b first so do you think about i should first focus on building the right product so product led growth like the, let the product speak for itself or you think about no i would do some marketing and see how it does and then move forward is there any sort of preference because see as you become large it's easier because you have luxury of you know resources to play both the games i yeah. think in the early stages of the difference love to hear from you on that so so just to be clear too actually charlie has been around for almost a decade uh and hmm. uh, and we're we, yeah we're actually older than uh algolia and um uh but at the, at the same time we're still really really innovating a lot and there's still mm-hmm. uh in data like you know we're we're big part of the data stack and there's just a lot to build and continue to build there's a lot of competitors out there that have like got gotcha. you 3 3 to 500 to 1000 uh developers and huge marketing teams and stuff like that so so there's always kind of this battle between yeah like the the self serve motion also building things that really differentiate that really stand out uh in uh uh you know a complicated uh product um su- such as a business intelligence product uh and so yeah it's always kind of a struggle and a balance um uh you know we had about like this quarter we had a, a bit of people focused on both so we had a lot of people really focused on about about 2/3 of the people really focused on some of the big innovations we've done um which has brought like collaboration and commenting to dashboards we also just launched in um march and continue to work on it what we call visual sequel we made a we based took sequel which is the most um powerful way to work with data and we made a visual version of it uh so that really anyone can do it we did a ton of user testing and prototyping to do that so a huge amount of effort into kind of bringing that innovation and really proving to ourselves and to others that um this is a product that now 8 out of 10 people that we use to test this with can intuitively mm-hmm. make charts themselves where every other product we've tested was was only 1 out of 10 so a lot of time and effort getting getting into those innovations that you have to be really confident um about putting that much time and effort into an innovation is this what some people really want uh and for us we definitely heard a lot from our customers and also it's just kind of the thesis and the mission of of ourselves as a company uh and so really putting a lot of resources on that makes a lot of sense uh and then but then about a third of our company uh in on the product management side was was very much focused on you know that sign up experience that that self sign up flow which in business intelligence is also very hard because the first thing you have to do when you come in it's not that useful unless you kind of connect your data up to it pretty technical challenge to do that to like hey go connect your redshift your postgres your segment uh and so um and so making that really easy making that really seamless for people uh as as much as possible uh and also you know having some support people there to to help them if they they hit any curbs and we were able to make a really big impact this past quarter on those numbers um uh and so it, it is a combo of, of 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 both uh focusing on that innovation and the product like growth and and they really feed each other as well like you know um us solving our mission is a big part of 
us getting to our growth and, and, and getting really differentiated in a, in a pretty noisy space. So I think I'll, I'll rephrase the question for, uh, I'll, I'll let Xavier and Anya jump into that. So I think, uh, how do you balance features that are good for, uh, good for growth versus features that customers are asking for? I mean, you answered that very well for Chartio, I think, where you focus, it seems more on the, go ahead, Dave, do you want to jump in? I'll add a third category to that, which is like features yeah, okay. that customers will love, but maybe aren't asking for, like innovations. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so that that's also a really hard one to, to figure out and balance. Sure. So I'll put them in the one bucket, customer uh, solving customer problems and whether it comes from them or we go identify by you know our research versus a growth uh, feature or a set of growth features. So how do you balance between them? How do you prioritize? Um, uh, I'll, I'll we'll go like with Anya, Xavier, and then Dave again, you can jump in if you have some last thoughts from Chartio. Anya, do you want to go first? Yeah, I love this question. I think the answer to this could certainly be a bit different if you're focusing on consumer versus B2B. So thinking about the consumer side, particularly, um, well, maybe I'll talk about both. So with Minecraft, I mentioned that we had a really, really passionate user base and community. They were super involved, super active on reporting bugs. We had a huge beta testing um, player base. And what that resulted in, in terms of really knowing your audience and knowing your users is for us, it was super important to always deliver on features that were in demand by users, right? They were super involved. They were convinced they knew what they wanted. If they wanted to add every single animal in existence and maybe even made up as a mob into the game, at some point we had to make sure that they felt heard. And even if it wasn't every single update, every single feature, we included something that they were demanding, we had to give them a roadmap and insight. It was very important for us to feel like they were heard. And that was both focused on and identified from the product side as well as the marketing side. It was it was in every functions and everyone's best interest to do that, just reflecting on the community that we had. And abstracting that a little bit, even thinking about how we were prioritizing what we were building for um, the music industry, particularly independent artists at Spotify, this was also always a, a tug and play because we knew there were some things that would help give us growth. We knew there were things that, would, that we can put in that would make their lives easier and would help us onboard new users faster since we were earlier on in the product um, lifecycle stage, right? We were just trying to find product market fit. Mm -hmm. But if we didn't include the need to have features that artists considered important, the things that they were focused on in their day-to-day -day that they would find the most relevant in order to switch, in order to adopt, in order to reconsider the product, then we would be losing them. So for example, promotion was the hardest thing to solve in that point in time in the music industry. Still could be, especially in the streaming space. And that was the must have whenever we spoke to any of our users, any uh, partners within the music industry, particularly in the independent space because they lacked access to promotion. Uh, and we wanted to focus on democratizing promotion and it was a super hard problem to solve. So we would have preferred not to start there, but we mm -hmm. found that it was a must have if we were to include growth as a goal for us and to really reach a relevant user base. So, so I think uh, I think this is great. Uh, two good insights, which I will extract from this, would be one: uh, focus more on knowing the user segments first. So that's like top of the pyramid in terms of learning what we have to learn. And second is for those segments, let's go solve the user problems. And if we are doing that, the growth will happen by itself. And then we can think about amplifying that with marketing, which you didn't add, but I'm asking: is that how you would think about it? Yes. And if we focus specifically on the question of do you prioritize, you know, what you want to build in your needs versus what your customers are asking for, the answer is that it's a delicate balance and yeah. you have to know what's important for your users. I would advise everyone if you're, you know, if you're planning a roadmap, if you're planning sort of a handful of feature releases, updates, months out, you should always be thinking about including things that are coming up from your community. You want them to feel involved. You want them to feel heard. And the more that you can make them feel that way, even if it's just a minor bug fix, the more engaged your user base will be, which is the name of the game these days for a lot of SaaS products, B2B or B2C. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. I, I kind of Xavier, think do you want to add? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I think there's a couple of buckets, right? When you think about um, 
the way we, we think about product uh, development, part of it is like a competitive play where you look at what gaps you have in the market, you track them effectively with your solutions architects or your technical teams about what are the things customers are telling you that you know we have or need or, or don't have and we need to develop to come up to parity with the market. Uh, also uh, doing uh, a lot of analysis on win-loss analysis of opportunities we want to have lost and surveying folks after the fact to understand we might have blind spots or we might think that a particular feature is a real leader when actually it's kind of a laggard compared to others, right? And getting that objective feedback is really important. Um, and then I think on the topic about, um, you know, leading with a new product evolution, uh, like building something for the customer before they even know that they, it, it's a requirement for them. I think that's, that's an important approach as well. The way we kind of balance that is we kind of have three pillars that guide our thoughts, right? If, if first of all, if our mission is to um, enable any company to build compelling search and discovery experiences, we think about it through three lenses. We think about it, what does it mean for the end user? Someone like one of the 600 million users uh, worldwide who interact with an Algolia search at least once a month. Like, what do they expect? What kind of dynamism, what kind of easy to understand UI should a front end that's offering a search give them? Then we think about the developers. Like, what are, what's the least road of friction for them to use our product? How do they get most productivity? Um, I had to laugh earlier or when Dave was talking about, you know, trialing a product and the first thing you have to do is upload data. It's exactly the same in, in our space for search as a service. And we want to obviously make that frictionless. If we want to talk to developers with the frameworks that they know, the, the UI paradigms that they're familiar with, the backend clients that they want to, to use, right? And then the third pillar is around the business user. So who, where do we want to play? How do we want to make sure that if, for example, we're selling to e-commerce and you have people that are responsible for the site experience. And then you have product merchandisers who are folks who are uh, category owners or really concerned about the, the merchandising of the search. How do you fit their needs effectively? And how do you make them uh, really driving business performance? So I think those are some of the elements. And also, um, who do you wanna be in the market? Who do you wanna be when you grow up, right? So in our space, the two big paradigms are open source or package solution. And we're definitely kind of somewhere in, in the middle, right? Because we give a lot of deep uh, customization to developers, but we also want to make sure you don't need a massive army of developers to get started, right? That, and that the a generalist developer who's kind of a full stack can do many, many more things with Algolia than maybe other solutions. So I think those are some of the principles that kind of guide our thinking around, yeah, build a gap versus, you know, something to fix a gap versus build a net new product feature that someone hasn't uh, even thought of yet. Totally. And Xavier, the, the, I think the, the team that's evolving from here, I'll come back, Dave, just a little bit. Uh, the team that's evolving is, again, consistent with what Anya said. What you just did, you, you also have a very mature thinking about your user segments. You have three different set of users, uh, and, and you call them, I mean, and we, they may have different needs, they may have different problems. So first of all, having that clarity is so important. I mean, I don't think every, uh, I mean, startup, obviously, they take time to get there, but even every marketing person or a product person or a product leader has that clarity. Maybe they're missing something. I think investing in that understanding of the user segments is definitely step one. I feel quite consistent in uh, on both of your answers. And it's the same true for what I have been working on, that we have to understand the user segments first and then figure out what are the needs and then go on. Dave, uh, I'll let you go. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I mean, no, that, that was a great segue. I mean, uh, so yeah, this, this question is really complicated for us. And I think in the past, um, We've, we've listened almost too much to our customers. Um, and we, I, I hate saying that this, it's not right. Uh, you should definitely listen to your customers as much as possible. But, but then I, I guess we weren't listening to the, 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 like all the customers and who we hear the most hmm. from, you know, is, is our power users. There are a lot of people who use Chartio all day and they're, they're like, their job is to be a data scientist, data analyst inside the company. They're very technical with the power users. So also keep in mind that we're really trying to build something for the business users as well. Uh, and um, so a lot of these power users, they'd already know the workarounds and they, they're used to the kinks in your product, the things that block other people from really adopting it. And, and they would, um, so they're requesting more things or they're requesting maybe a feature that they saw your competitor has, uh, you know, and, and so you end up, if you just follow all that, they're like, you know, you make this map type or make that, you know, you, you can just end up making a clone of your competitor set out there uh, and, and nothing really differentiated. And, and we're trying to make something innovative and differentiated. So we really had it, what we're, we had to go to is user tests and do a lot, a lot of user tests on uh, people just 
first trying the product because so many people come in uh, and, and you don't hear from the people who got confused and went away. Uh, you, you hear from the people that are the, those power users. So you got to also make sure, find some way to listen to those people, especially if you want product like growth, because uh, those people that are falling out of that funnel, you know, you, you got to go hear from them. Uh, and so we did a much better job of that. And our, our channel was um, use, using user tests to, to, to get people like that to, to come try our product and uh, it helped tremendously. Awesome. So, so let me, Dave, I'll extract something from this as well. I think uh, what I'm hearing is uh, it's possible you may be building for the wrong segment because you're, you're not, you're not explored or spent more time understanding the entire ecosystem. Uh, so the more, the moment you open that window and focus on understanding the entire ecosystem, you might find segments that are really uh, product market fit for you and then go deeper in those. Is that, a good way to frame your story. Yeah, yeah, and and finding that balance between like some things that are really going to help you uh, drive yeah. more adoption and, and and attract more people versus things that um, you know just certain power users kind of want and maybe a lot are asking for. Uh, that's that's a tough balance because you really want to make those power users happy. You want to um, and and so ideally you raise a lot of money and do both. Uh, and sometimes, <laughs> uh, but but everybody has some. There's uh, you can't do all of it uh, all at once, or or um, things awesome. will be a lot different. But uh, um, but yeah, that's a, that's that's a tough challenge to figure out that balance, and and it's it's an art, honestly. I I don't know, um, you know, I don't know if I have the best framework for it, but but I do know that it's important to really well represent um, yeah. all the users, and and really keep in mind, especially if you want product like growth, really keep in mind that onboarding experience totally. and all the people really trying your product, not just the people who are already used to it. One of the so, most exciting things uh, for on. me about the growth stage yeah. was actually having the ability to kind of go back and then choosing where you want to focus. Because when you're yeah. just getting something out there, you're cutting a lot of corners, it's MVP yeah. territory, yeah. the onboarding mm -hmm. experience is not totally. the most you would have liked it. It might not be full featured, but the growth stage is where you decide where you want to double down and you get to go back totally. and like fine tune some of those parts. And what we actually ended up doing um, at Minecraft is we would choose a theme. So it could be a quarter, it could be a particular update, and we would say, okay, for this one, we want to focus on new users and people that don't know how to play the game and wouldn't normally consider it. And for this one, we're going to go delight all the power obsessive mm -hmm. players that spend um, all day playing. And that would kind of help us focus, at least for a point at a time. That's I amazing. Totally, uh, totally agree on that, Anya, about uh, a theme around a launch, or I think that's killer and definitely totally applicable. And helpful for marketing. <laughs> I, so uh, on, on that uh, tactics on team, I think it's a very good, well, we have also tried that before, it works really well. Uh, the other thing we have tried in the same concept of team in my previous products and even current, uh, sometimes we don't understand the problem, but we want to execute because you have to go do something as a team. It's a reality, like we all face that and, and growth is similar, like we all think doing ABC might give us instinctively that especially the consumer side because we all use the product. Let's go build this, let's go build that and we might see some big wins. I think not doing that is very important and what we call is an understand goal for the quarter or for the half. We say, team, go understand this half. It's okay to not build. It's okay to stop and understand. You always have two parallel tracks going on in that case. One that you don't know in your understanding, which will influence your next uh, sort of uh, sprint slash half quarter. And the other is execution. I think that mix has helped a lot, especially with growth. Um, there are a lot of things like user segments uh, for, our, uh, for Facebook. Like we're working on buying and selling homes or cars on Facebook. We have to understand we can't be we can't be selling expensive cars or expensive homes on Facebook, but there are groups. But what are groups? What's happening there? And we have we had less insights there. So taking the understand goals to define the segments, and then to Zeev is your point. Where do you want to be in that segment? Is super important. So I think that's a good framework. Number one, uh, both goes hand in hand. Second, identify your user segments. I love that coming consistently from all of you. Then where you want to be in this in that segment, what experience or what kind of uh, service or problem you want to solve for that segment and then figure out the gaps to get there could be a good approach on how we sort of address growth overall for any 
uh, any product that we have seen so far. Is that is that a good summary of what we discussed so far? Okay, cool. Moving on. So uh, we have some time left. I'd love to take some questions from the audience that we have got from Product School. So jumping right into questions, it's an interesting one coming in the COVID times. When selling a physical consumer product online, how does one go about a, a product-led growth approach? I would call it, how would one goes about, uh, about uh, growing their product? Uh, that's how I think about it. So you have a physical consumer product and you want to sell, uh, sell it online. How would you go about that? In terms of strategy, yeah. Who wants to take that? I have no I idea how to sell a physical product. So uh, <laughs> uh, I would make it photogenic so it gets shared and viral on, on Instagram or something like that. <laughs> something people really want to, that, that'd be the viral loop of that product. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I could be a little cheeky and say you need great search and discovery, but uh, laughing aside, I would say, yeah, um, finding the right channels where you think you have expansion opportunities with that particular product. Um, yeah, whether it's a, a social media a play, whether it's a, an e-commerce play, whether it's um, another type of channel for for getting the word out on your product and, and making it easy to buy. I guess, yeah, in, in any case, reducing friction, I think is key, regardless of the channel that you're, that you're leveraging. I, yeah, I don't, I don't have as like, much okay. experience in terms of selling physical products. The like two mm -hmm. anecdotes I can right. make. Yeah. It's something that I've struggled with um, in terms of leadership and being open to trying new things, both at Minecraft and at Spotify, actually, is thinking mm -hmm. about, do you bring the users, your customers to you, or do you go where the customers are? And I think this is a really big problem when it comes to selling online for physical products. So for Minecraft, for example, our margins were much better if people came and bought the game from our websites versus selling it through Amazon or other marketplaces, et cetera. And similarly for Spotify with the Apple App Store, for example. Um, I think this has become a physical and digital problem. And my answer is, <laughs> I, I think you need to be open to trying, especially if you know, you've been hit with the pandemic, you weren't prepared, perhaps your online sales challenges weren't the best, and you find yourself you know, between a rock and a hard place, you need to recognize where your strengths and your competencies are, especially I'm big on core competencies where you want to continue investing and focusing. So maybe you might open yourself up to trying other channels, learning from those channels, really learning more about those types of customers that come in through those channels and then figuring out and reevaluating how you want to double down on that. I, I, I like that. I would rather also sell our framework that we all came up with today, which is let's go understand who are your users. So define your user segments, uh, which is very similar to what you just said, Anya, uh, go to go where your users are. So that's number one. Second is what do you want to do? Where you want to be? If you're if figuring out where exactly you want to be in the next couple of months would be important to, to figure out which investment goes where. So for instance, if you're a furniture store seller, you want to sell 10 furniture online, you don't have to set up a big store. You might just be well off uh, running small ad hoc campaigns on Facebook or Google to get some people in and, and, and make the conversion just through a phone call. So I think, again, uh, defining the user segments, uh, understanding uh, their needs and, and where you want to, how can you solve their problems? Uh, basically find the gap and then, then figuring out the channel which will help you solve that gap or uh, bring those people into the product will definitely help uh, in this current time and also in future. So that's how I think traditionally companies have done in the past who have moved from on, offline to online. Okay, moving on to the next question. And I think we have time for this one, the last one. It's an interesting one. So. What is the best way to do marketing, to do uh, the first launch of a product? So they think of it as your, when you all started, I mean, uh, Dave and uh, Xavier as well, like you, you guys have seen journeys of all the products and same with Anya. What do you recommend uh, people start with as the first marketing launch? I can maybe take a quick stab at that. And I'll caveat yeah. this by saying that I've never worked at a company that was launching a pure product from scratch. I've always come in where there was something established, but within those companies, we have launched net new products along the way. Um, one, one element I think is important, and again, this is from a B2B lens, is like thought leadership. So 
Um, if you're thinking about, for example, uh, in our world, we do a lot of things around voice or natural language understanding. And those are kind of a little slightly more emerging technologies in the marketplace. Um, and so one key element is really generating a lot of thought leadership and spending time with customers who are really passionate about the topic. So that's, that's one thing I think is important to start to formulate what's going to be the broader message that will then resonate, which is that's, that's one, one pointer that I found in terms of uh, kind of an emerging product area. Anya, Dave, do you want to go? Dave, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I would say um, we just launched in, in March. It was, it was like a thing we've been working a year and a half on our visual sequel. Uh, and uh, we launched it. We, we bought a whole bunch of banners and, and uh, booths, and, and we bought lunch for everyone at the Saster conference. Uh, but this was right when the pandemic came out. We actually launched on the day the pandemic was allowed, announced. Uh, so uh, all, all of our kind of like in-person conference launch plans went to the wayside. Um, but uh, what worked is I wrote a really great story about how and why we built what we built. Um, and it was a really great narrative uh, digging into the considerations a bit and the challenges and, and even, even my emotions going through it. At one point, I'd kind of almost... I felt like I had disproven the mission that I've spent so much of my life on that like business users won't be able to work with and write queries. Uh, and, and that was many months into it. And I, uh, and so I shared that. And so writing a story about it, um, uh, I think is important. Put yourself in it, put the journey in it uh, and let people come along with that, especially your first version of the product won't be perfect. Uh, and so asking people, but telling them where you want to go and asking them to come along for the ride, they'll be a lot more forgiving. They'll be a lot more excited about it. Um, I also like to take a, you know, I think I live here in San Francisco near Napa County. I, I sometimes when I really want to look at good marketing, I go up to do some wine tastings and the people there just, you know, everybody's got the same bottle, <laughs> different label on it, uh, tastes a little bit different. And the, the, the salesmanship they have there of like the stories they put into that wine, uh, the, the romance they put in, you know, these were imported from here. And here's the story of the person who started this vineyard. Uh, that's what people are really buying and taking home and they're sharing that at a dinner party that they're going to and like, Oh, you know, I got this blah, blah, blah. So putting the story into your product, I think that's something people really connect with uh, and can be a big way, uh, especially as you're starting out and launching something. People, people love seeing that people love the journey part of that. Uh, even, even, sometimes even more than the actual product. So definitely, definitely awesome. utilize. That. Thanks. I do have any last thoughts on this before I summarize. Yeah, for sure. I had initially taken this question from a product perspective. So in terms of what you'd want to do when planning for like an initial launch of a, of a new product as a product manager or product lead, let's say. Um, so the first thing kind of when the way we've been using the framework that you've so hopefully put together, Mayank, is knowing your audience. In this case, knowing your product. How big is this launch? How big is this product? And planning making a launch plan that's commensurate but first have a launch plan ideally together with marketing and product and as well as other stakeholders you want to make sure support everyone is included that said um if it is super important especially if it's like your first big product you want to have a strike team you want to be meeting um with cross-functional stakeholders days weeks even months leading up to the launch we were planning a huge launch when we were doing our initial um, beta product at spotify to allow independent artists to upload music directly we had this war room and strike team for months before we launched and leading up to the big launch we were literally meeting in a war room daily so the other thing is maybe you want to have a war room and that means like everyone in there ready to plan at the last minute coordinating when you're turning the product on, when you're letting users in, when you're launching your blog posts, coordinating with PR and press, et cetera. Um, and then additionally, it, as a part of that plan, also really encourage um, having engineers on hand for support. Inevitably, there will be hot fixes. There will be bugs that come up as much bug squashing as you think you've done. So being prepared to do that weeks leading up to the launch and obviously during the week that you first launched and users are flooding in. Um, and if it's possible, even thinking about doing, having an alpha beta testing group so that you're removing a lot of these surprises beforehand, the more you can 
quietly, if possible, <laughs> get it into the hands of your users and your customers to test and play around with beforehand, it will make for a much smoother launch. So test, test, and test as much as you can. Um, and I think someone else mentioned this already, but know what your goals are. So when you initially started working on launching this product, you may have long-term KPIs that you're tracking, but particularly for the launch, what are the initial signals you'll be looking for to know that it's headed in the right direction? How will you evaluate the, the launch momentum in itself? Um, and knowing when you have to play interference, if some of those initial indicators are, you know, showing one. And finally, have an easy way for your um, customers to give feedback. Sometimes those processes can be really buried if you're not really giving them the kind of easy formatting and ways to submit it and you're just giving them an email address, a lot of them won't take the initiative and the time to go that extra route to make it as easy for them as possible. Like that covered a whole roadmap, Anya. Thank you so much. <laughs> very, very useful. Awesome. Uh, we are at time. This was a very, very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I would summarize our framework for our viewers so that they can use it and, and uh, go and do the road mapping based on that if it's useful. So I think the conclusion as I'm hearing is so far based on our conversation is uh, the product led growth and marketing, they go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. Um, the team should work together. Uh, it's the power of that cross functional team that creates uh, a very impactful outcome that we want. So that's what we have discussed as a team, uh, as four of us together here. Uh, in terms of what are the steps to move forward when you think about growth, uh, what you learn from this group is number one, know your audience and how you do that, go define the user segments. If you don't have them, they can understand goal, focus on it, define them. Second is for those segments, where do you want to be? Uh, so if uh, to Lajia's point, like uh, for his uh, app developers, what exactly do you want to solve for them or what is the North Star you want for, North Star you want, uh, want for them? So define those goals for each user segments. The third thing is now figure out the gaps between where you want to be versus where you are and solve for the problems the users have either by hearing them to Anya's point, to Dave's point, or by proactively doing research to figure out the ones that could be opportunities which users may not have thought of. And that becomes our roadmap to go execute. The last thing is, when all this works, if you think adding money and more marketing can amplify the impact, add more money, add more marketing, amplify the impact, double your goal, <laughs> double your impact from the overall initiative that you're running. So I think that's that's pretty much what uh, we all have been doing so far, I think, and we have learned in phases, but putting it together in this uh, four-point system will really help uh, our viewers to, to go back and use it for their own products. So thank you so much uh, for this lovely talk. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Maya. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. You guys had great points, and Mike, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>